G'day, and uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Lanark County Confidential. My name is Mike Lynch Staunton. I'm your host, and uh, I'll be talking to you today about uh, a couple of things here. Um, just want to get <clears> this <throat> out of the way. Uh, Lanark County Confidential is being broadcast on the WRVO Radio Network, a division of Reno Vial Outdoors. Um, WRVO is a internet radio network, um, a talk radio uh, about fishing in the outdoors with information and entertainment as well, too. If you've listened to George Byrne, you'll know what I need. Um, hope, you did. hope you get the humor in that one, George, but I enjoy listening to MTVT. Anyways, um, uh, WRVO is broadcast live 24 hours a day on such venues as TuneIn Radio and Shoutcast Radio. So, uh, plus the WRVO uh, um, on Reno Viola Outdoors. All you have to do is go to Reno Viola Outdoors, and there's a link there for the uh, for the radio network. So you can listen to it online as well too. So and that's generally what I do when I'm cruising through facebook and stuff like that so i've listened to all the shows and uh it's pretty cool lineup uh we've got angler and hunter radio which is associated with the television program and and the organization bluefish radio uh, as i've just heard of that one so i'm not sure which what that's all about then we have the bs session with mike and uh scott uh pretty entertaining too uh fish talk radio uh hooked for life Lanner County Confidential, Nothing Bad Outdoors with Amanda Lynn, uh, A Outdoor Journal, uh, Outdoor Radio, Politically Correct uh, Redneck, Reno Viola In Depth, The First Cast, The Real Addiction, The Tackle Box, and Up the Creek. So um, it's got a you know a good lineup and, and uh, um, a good variety of different uh, producers that are putting some i think pretty entertaining stuff out here so anyways and it's informative as well too so um so uh this is episode number what is that just today uh 19 and it's uh it's a bit different i'm doing this in the morning and it's just beautiful in lanark county i it's raining again <laughs> i was out walking the dogs yesterday and there's about four inches of water in the field and uh there's just no way they're going to cut any hay around here at all, so uh, which is kind of a drag. But <clears throat> so on to other stuff. Uh, today's show, I thought I'd uh, continue, or today's episode, I thought I'd continue um, the discussion or my little discussion, whatever, on uh, tournament tactics, and uh, I sort of ended off with the last episode on. Uh, leaving it to this one, so this one would be um, basically on uh, the pre-fish. So, well, that's what I'll, I'll, co- I'll consider it is the pre-fish. So, um, looks like I've got some problems here. Doesn't look like I'm getting any level on. Now this thing sounds like it's screwing up, but we'll see what happens. Because um, I'm not really hearing myself. Oh, there I go. I can hear myself now. So, uh, anyways, maybe this will help. Maybe the rain's not doing too good. So, anyways, um, where was I? Uh, the prefish, yeah. Uh, so, what I do when I go prefishing, um, yeah. In, in the last episode, I basically it came down to um, you studied your map. Once you would figured out, you know, you had a you know a good selection of about twenty spots that you want to pick, um, start them out. Now, some of the spots uh, would probably be considered better afternoon spots. So, you know, you still are going to make a lineup of how you want to approach them. 
And then um, I go out with four or five rods rigged with pretty much horizontal lures. Um, and I'll have a top water on. Uh, I'll have a jerk bait on. Jerk bait that doesn't go much below five feet. And um, uh, then I'll also have a um, crankbait on that goes down to about eight feet. Um, and then I'll have a spinner bait, um, which is per most of the time three quarter ounce spinner bait so I can get I'll just let that go all the way down to the bottom and I'll be you know like a uh, if I really want to go deep 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 say you know 12 15 feet type thing um, and that'll be like a willow leaf blade so it doesn't have too much lift on it and uh, probably mostly a single willow leaf uh, basically you want a slow roll two willow leaves will do but you know not very big um, I used to do that in the fall time. Just go out and take a big spinner bait, three quarter ounce spinner bait, and chuck it out and let it hit the bottom, and then just slow roll it across the bottom, and you'd be surprised what you pick up that way. Uh, but anyway, so because basically you want to you you want to cover your water depths, and then I'll have um, what I've discovered over the last couple of years uh, by gamblers, the big easy, and it's uh, it's it's just an awesome piece of plastic to to use for uh, pre fishing. Uh, one of the reasons is because it's got some weight. Um, I know a lot of you guys out there are very uh, well, a lot of the guys out there know what flapping shads are. And flapping shads, most of the time when we're throwing flapping shads, uh, you might have a 16th ounce weight screwed into the nose of it just to give it that extra, added extra weight to it to get it out there. And, and when it gets in the weeds, into the open areas, sort of nose down a bit so it doesn't just sit on the top all the time. Because uh, I, I generally, like, I, I, I don't do a lot of frog fishing. Um, what I'll do is I'll just throw uh, something across the top of the water rather than, um, you know, going for that, uh, um, f throwing the frog out and let it sit or, you know, working it as a frog. I... I, you know, I think it, a lot of top water has to do with reaction as well. Um, they see the splash, they see something going across, so they're reacting quickly. They're in there feeding, obviously. So, and depending depending on how uh, aggressively they're feeding is, you know, depending on how they're going to go after your lure. So, um, if you throw it out there and you see a lot of movement right away. Um, towards it, not away from it, but towards it, then, you know, you're pretty much there going there. You can consider them somewhat aggressive, I guess, unless they're pike or something like that. But um, so at that point, you know, you're going to be moving it rather quickly and you don't want to, you don't want to stop it really. You want to, you want to make sure that, that uh, they chase after it. And then once they blow up on it, like, you know, wait a second or whatever, you know, it's the same stuff as you see on TV and stuff. You guys always tell you to wait. Just if, if you got a good enough rod, you'll feel the weight of the fish on there and then you can set the hook. A lot of times they'll take it and they start to turn and, and run away. So as long as you don't jerk too hard, and uh, and the rod's stiff enough to set the hook. You can you can pretty much just do a, you know, not a gentle hook set, but you know, um, uh, three quarter. You don't have to. That's what I found, anyways. Most of the time, when I, when they hit a when they blow up on the big easy or they blow up on the flopping shot, I'll just sort of bow the rod to them a bit for a second, and then I'm picking it up and I'm loading the rod at that point. So, and. Uh, uh, and I, I used to just uh, react every time, poof, you know, the fish would blow up on it, and uh, and then you'd you know set the hook, and then there'd be nothing there. So, so there got to be a bit more patient. But uh, uh, but generally, uh, some of the times the fish are sitting just underneath the lily pads. This is when they're a bit less active, and uh, that's when um, you know a senko or an ace will be. It'd be good. But the, th the point of the matter here is we're looking for active fish. We're looking for fishing in the area. So um, you got to blow up and you don't get a contact with it. That's okay. Um, if I went into an area and say it was a weed bed with lily pads and stuff like that, and, you know, I'm going to take 20 minutes. That's about it. That's all I'm going to take for this area. It can't be more than about, you know, say a football field big type thing because I'm going to put the trolling motor on half speed. And I'm just going to burn through it as much as I possibly can. Uh, a lot of times I'll just go down the edge and, and check the edges first just to see if there's any fish on the edges. And, 
and, and you want to be pretty uh, I, I remember going pre-fishing and, and it was more of a day fishing than pre-fishing the reason why was because we did pretty crappy in the tournament so if we had a good pre-fish uh, uh, we just uh, you know considered that that's what uh, you know we sort of took it that was compensation for the bad day of the tournament and then uh, I s decided that catching fish on the pre-fish was not as important as locating the fish um, in an area so that you can come back in a day or two or, or you know, even a week at times because that's the way the dictates went. Um, and, and being able to catch them later on um, because these fish hadn't been molested for, you know, seven days or whatever, so... Uh, then that's what I started to realize after, you know, not finishing while in tournaments and, uh, and seeing other guys doing really well and, and then reading a few books, uh, getting some more information and then experimenting myself and just seeing how, you know, this generally works. And, uh, I found that, uh, trying to, uh, win a tournament on a pre-fish is counterproductive. So um, the pre-fish is, is mainly to find the productive areas where the fish are at that time and then come back to it. And, uh, and if you find them there, great. If not, then you're going to have to start looking. But, you know, it still gives you generally a good area where the fish should be. Um, based on a based on a on a you know an honest prefish type thing because uh, I mean I, I've done I had a few it's when you do prefishing with partners and you do it uh, separately you sort of got to have an understanding with your partner that um, if they say it's a three pound fish it's a three pound fish um, and you can't go based on the fact that they just want to impress you or you want to impress them or what. Because I did that as well, too, before. I mean, uh, my partners, how was your pre-fish? You know, and I was catching ones and twos and stuff like that. And, I, you know, oh, it was a good spot. And, and it was a mediocre spot, you know. Um, so you, you sort of got to be honest with yourself and your partner's got to be honest with you um, if that's how you're doing it. I mean, if you're pre-fishing together, then, you know, it doesn't really matter. But generally, I always had uh, an understanding with hopefully my partners, or hopefully I have this understanding with my partners that, uh, you know, if you catch a fish, you weigh it and you're honest about what the size is. Because if we go in a tournament and people are catching three-pound average fish, uh, a two-and-a-half, an area where two-and-a-halves are generally isn't going to cut it. So, uh, and and I've found in my years of fishing that um, if you can find an area where you have fish that are three, okay, I shouldn't say two-and-a-half, but yeah, under two pounds type thing, uh, I found that if you can find an area where you can, f when you have fish that are like, you know, just under three pounds, two eights, two nines and stuff like that, into threes and stuff like that, th that's a better area than <clears throat> a one and a half to two. So um, that's just, that's just, just been my experience. So, um, and I base my pre-fishing on that premise now that uh, if I find an area in there, you know, like I say, one and a half, twos to you know just just under shy two and a half and stuff like that i'll i'll have a tendency of marking that as a you know lower priority than an area of where um you know say i flip a dock and i catch a four in a dock um that's area is going to have a higher priority than a weed bed where you know i catch a couple of twos or some lily pads where i've caught you know a one and a half or a two or something like that so uh, and then, but that's sort of like the deep briefing afterwards. So you're doing your pre-fish and you're, you know, you're, you're out there and you're, you sort of want to base it on how the tournament is, because like I say, you don't want to, you don't want this to end up being, um, a day fishing. You got to sort of got to use some discipline to it, um, and stuff like that. And because I mean that's you're spending thousands of dollars to do this sport to do these tournaments and stuff like that so uh, you're going to have to sort of expect a certain return after a while either that or you're just going to have to say to yourself well I'm just doing it for the hell of it and I can afford to do this and it's no big deal at that point you know I can afford to 
blow five or six thousand dollars a year and uh and not get any return for it and uh and hopefully if i do have sponsors they don't really care what my standings are whether i've won a tournament or not so um but but it sort of comes down to uh that's sort of like the discipline that you're going to have to d develop because come tournament time and this is going to be in my next segment and or the next uh, episode because the next episode is going to be on the mental game and i think that's pretty a lot of times that's that's there's there's a big um uh, that has a big, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, importance. It's got, uh, anyways, we'll get into it in, in the next episode, how you got to develop a mental game. Um, and once that mental game comes, then, you know, your pre-fish becomes more disciplined and you end up doing uh, 20 minutes saying, okay, that's it. Didn't find anything. Or yeah, we did find something, and you write it down, and you go, okay, this area, and 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 you know, you, you sort of keep. It. I've been in the last few years keeping logs of where I've caught fish, time of year, uh, what I caught them on, um, you know, time of day, stuff like that. Because I've got a couple of humps on Big Rito that you don't bother going to until after two thirty in the afternoon, because you can fish them in the early in the morning and stuff like that. And, it doesn't matter, but you know, after two, two thirty in the afternoon, phew, that's when their bigger fish come on to them. So, um, and that's that's pretty much been uh, uh, that's been ninety percent consistency on all of that. So, I and that's what I like. You know, fish are fish are creatures of habit. They do things at certain times. They do things based on water temperature. They do base things on on uh, you know on. Uh, time of day or you know length of day and stuff like that so um they have little roots they they have little paths that they follow uh you know typically um, I, I could tell you, I, I, <clears throat> I was told a story well it's not a story but it's it was a it was a situation on uh, a lake around here and biologists was following a school of fish school of large mouth or small mouth and uh you can actually hear the rain. There we go. It's raining again in Lanark. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the biologist was following this school of uh, a smallmouth. And uh, in front of him, um, there was a point, And he could tell by the echo sound, uh, the, the, the volume of it, how far the fish were away and whether they were coming towards him or moving away from him. And they were moving away from him and they were moving towards these guys in the boat. So he just sat there and he watched the guys in the boat start catching fish. And then about a half an hour later, the school had moved on. The guy stopped catching fish. And he went up to them about a half an hour later and said to them, uh, how was your day fishing? And, and they said, oh, well, um, well, they were biting there about a half an hour ago, but they've turned off. But uh, they'll turn back on again, you know, this afternoon, probably, usually. And... Uh, and knowing this school of fish, because he studied them for a long time, a period of time, he knew they wouldn't be back. Uh, he knew that that uh, they were going. They they have a, a little run that they do, which is about two kilometers long, and it sometimes it takes them a couple of days. Sometimes it takes them four or five days. Sometimes it doesn't take them long at all. And depending on how active they are, is depending on how um, they move up and down this two kilometer sort of path. So, it, you know, it gets me thinking that, uh, um, you know, fish aren't much different than us. I mean, we drive to work every day on a habitual basis and, and you know, we do things uh, of habit as well, too. So, um, you know, they, the bass will do things based, you know, at deer will do base, turkeys do base, uh, stuff based on, on all sorts of, uh, of uh, inputs from nature. So... If you look at them from that aspect, if, uh, if you look at the pre-fish from that aspect, you go, okay, I'm looking for active fish right now. Um, they may, they're not going to go far. Um, they may go a quarter mile. They may, they, you know, they may go even less than a largemouth. Pff, he's not going to go far, maybe 100 yards, maybe less than that. You're going to be someplace close by. But, you know, 
but he's just not eating that day. So then, you know, that's when you slow down, and that's, you know, generally during the tournament, and you've already determined that this area is going to be a good area. So you go into it, and you throw your, your, uh, your, your you know, horizontal baits, and you don't get anything, and then that's when you make the decision to slow down. Okay, so, um, and and that's where it, uh, it sort of leads into the tournament. So, um so, you know, sort of to sum up, because I want to say a little, I, wanna, I got a little rant here I want to do, but it's not a rant, it's sort of a, anyways, um, what, uh, what your pre-fish is all based on is locating fish. Uh, what the tournament is going to be based on is catching those fish. Uh, sometimes those fish are very active, so it's easy to catch them. Sometimes they're not, so then at that point, then you're turning into the finesse stuff, and, and at that point, you have... Um, you know, vertical baits on your on your boat at that point. So if you go out and you limit yourself just to horizontal baits, because I used to go out and I used to make it just a fun day of fishing. I spent two hours in this place and, the, oh, and I'll finesse them up and stuff like that. And I was just wasting my time. Totally, totally wasting my time. Didn't fish much of the lake. Didn't find much of the lake. And then the tournament comes and, you know, maybe we lucked out here and there. But, you know, generally it was a mediocre finish, so. Um, the, 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 the times that we did do well, um, the pre-fish, um, on that area pretty much sucked. Um, it, it, we caught a couple of fish. They were good fish, but, uh, what just happened in one tournament is the school moved into that point and, uh, in 45 minutes we had 11 fish in, in the live well. So, um, now does that happen a lot? Well, Sometimes on deeper fish it can, so, but usually on shallow fish it won't. So, uh, you know, you, and and that's the other thing I got to say is is in your pre-fish you should have a combination of shallow spots and deep spots as well too. You know, shallow spots like maybe docks and stuff like that, or a weed bed, or you know, lily pad patches or weed beds or some blow-ups. It depends on the on the situation. You know, like if I'm fishing Kilmarnock or, or an area on a river that has a lot of wind to it and it's blowing mat up and stuff like that, then, you know, I'm going to be punching mat maybe on, on a day when it's stinking hot out and they're up underneath it because it's a bit cooler water. Um, so it depends on uh, this year. i, I got to say a lot of fish are going to be shallow because, uh, uh, you know, we got an extra foot of water, so everything's going to be moved up, I think. So, um, But we'll find out this weekend because I'm going to... I've, I've ever been out, but uh, I just went out to run the boat and throw a few, you know, throw, I threw a, a big easy there with the, with my does it on it, and I think that's pretty cool. So this weekend I'm going to get real serious about it and uh, and go out because uh, my wife wants to go out as well too, and hopefully it just doesn't rain all weekend long, but they say, but we'll see what happens. Um, anyways, um, uh, I think I'm going to wrap this one up. And anybody's got any questions or whatever, send me an email at info at lanarcountyconfidential.ca. Um, I'm working on a website still, but uh, it's slow. You know, I got a lot of things to do, but I keep saying that. So, um, anyways, I, I wanted to say something here. Um, I got it. You know, I'm looking at the the media, and I'm looking at the news, and I'm looking at all this crap that's going on. I'm looking at at uh, you know leaders that uh, like McGinty is a perfect example of uh, of, of what I'm talking about. Um, the roasting that Rob Ford is taking through the media. Now, I got nothing good or bad to say about the guy like Rob Ford. You know, he is what he is, but I just think the way he's been treated lately has been despicable. Um, you know, uh, anyways, you got, you got, and, and this speaks to the integrity of the media, okay? And this whole thing comes down to, like I said, I, I did a, a past podcast on integrity, and uh, it comes down to, um, you know, I, I've talked to a few people about it over the last few weeks, and they, they a lot of them are greens with me that, uh, you know, you look at uh, the crap that happened in the Senate, um, Mike Duffy and Pamela Wallen, you know, now she was nice enough to get up on TV and say, yeah, I did it, and I screwed up, and we're going to fix it, and da 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 and backpedaling and all the rest of that. But uh, you sort of wonder how they got in there to begin with anyways. They, they helped the the... the 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 um, 
the party get elected. But then again, if they're that partisan, I thought they were supposed to be news people and unbiased and stuff like that. How do you can do that? How can you just all of a sudden leave your your job as a as a media person and then boom, all of a sudden I'm a conservative or whatever? Ah, man, you're a conservative before that. You just didn't want to admit it for Christ's sakes. So all of your your broadcast was biased that same way and they you know it just goes to speak to the integrity of the person that they don't want to even be honest with themselves about what they're doing and what they're saying in public and stuff so and then you have the guy like mike duffy like what an arrogant sob uh, the guy you know uh, oh everything will be found out once uh da, 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 this and that and like uh, hello what's wrong with your finances that you have to get somebody else to pay back ninety thousand dollars Whoa, buddy, maybe you should put the lunches down a bit. And uh, But anyways, you know, and then you got guys like Lance Armstrong and Tiger Woods and, and uh, you know, this, uh, this football player now who apparently shot a friend of his. And uh, he's sort of kind of got to... And, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to be overdramatic or anything like that, but um, I agree this has been going on for a while. I grew up in a day where they killed the president, so... Um, and the controversy and the conspiracy theory and BS about that, and you know, and then the next president, no, not him, but the one comes after, you know, does all sorts of despicable things. So lacking your integrity is going on for a long time. If you go back through history and look at some of the stuff that's happened, some of the wars that have started because of it, it's it's just not a it's it's not a um, it's a universal thing. Lack of integrity, obviously. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a human, it's human nature, to, I guess, to have lack of integrity. So, um, so what's my point? My point is, uh, I don't like to see it. It's, uh, um, especially in, in people that are supposed to be in politics and leading the country and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't want to see it in a teacher. I wouldn't want to see it in, in somebody that's going to be an example to the kids out there. Um, so I guess that's what my point is. So when the media comes about vilifying a guy like Rob Ford and Crackpipe and all the rest of that with, without any real credible uh, information, um, that sort of just goes to show the, the lack of morality maybe that that news media outlet has. So, um, and that's a sad thing. Uh, I thought they you know, would show a bit more fortitude and and have a bit uh you know more respect for people and you know check into the stories a bit more i i know i know when i was growing up uh I, the news media never would have done something like that so it's the change in the tactics i guess that is sort of disheartening and is you know making me upset about the fact that these people want to go and and think, oh yeah, this is all well and fine to do to somebody. Um, if what Ford's doing is cleaning up the city hall and, and making it run more efficiently and stuff like that, uh, and he's stepping on toes, hey, all the more power to him. Uh, if he's not, if he's pulling a McGinty, I don't know. We won't find out for a few years. But, you know, you got to give the guy a chance. He got elected. Uh, the people wanted him in. So give him a chance and let him do what he's got to do. Um, how McGinty got in after he did what he did the first two times just baffles my mind. But it's probably the same people that put Rob Ford in. So, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I don't know what to say other than the fact that um, we pick the people that we want to elect. And I'm sure that there's very superficial... Um, checking into their past and stuff like that because uh, I don't know how uh, a guy whose you know brothers used to sell drugs and hang out where they did and did what they did uh, and how they grew up the way they did um, you can sort of see how there would probably be a lack of integrity in that family upbringing you know um, and and that's what ends up happening. Um, parents parent, and kids learn from the parents. So if the parents are corrupt, the kids most likely are going to be corrupt as well too. Um, you know, so you know we sort of get what we choose. So at this point, 
and we're our standards are being lowered so we're choosing people with less integrity and i guess that's my point is we should raise our standards a bit our own personal standards and our own standards that we have for our politicians and our leaders out there because uh, they clearly don't have many of our beliefs in their uh, they may say they do that, but but generally, they're looking at the the lobbyists and and the public interest, and that's basically where they're going, and they're looking at it for economic means and stuff. So you know, the corporations are going to end up having the major control over the decisions that are made by the government because of the fact that these leaders are, are being uh, exploited uh, by saying, well, we'll take our businesses elsewhere. Well, I rather doubt that. I really doubt that. I doubt that some of these companies will just up and leave because uh, it's going to cost them way too much money, uh, where they, you know, they're going to lose their market share and stuff like that. But I may be wrong and, you know... <laughs> The only way to find out is is to, uh, for them to let them, you know like uh, businesses come and go, um, business ebbs and flows. Uh, times change, businesses change. Uh, we don't have the horse, we don't have the Pony Express today. So what I'm trying to get across is that as some businesses go out of business because they're too archaic in the ways that they do business, we have more progressive, more. Um, broader-minded, more intelligent-thinking businesses come in, uh, which are more sustainable. Um, obviously, the more archaic ones are archaic because they're probably unsustainable. So, anyways, that's my rant. I don't like to see, yeah, you know, Lance Armstrong. It's pit it's pitiful to see that. It's, the reason I'm saying Lance Armstrong is because I think 60 Minutes did a thing on him the other night or something like that. So that's why I brought my that to mind. Tiger Woods, come on, like. <laughs> There must be some of this, uh, there must be some kind of hormonal change that comes along with fame. And I hope I don't get famous. Um, that, that leads these guys down this road that says, um, I'll get away with it. <laughs> I don't know. I'll get away with it. I can do this. I'll get away with it. Nobody will know. Or, you know, you won't say anything, will you? Christ, you can't tell 10 people not to say anything. Try telling one person not to say anything. Jeez. So, I don't know. Maybe these guys' egos just um, overcome themselves. Anyways, that's enough for what I'm going to say. This weekend, I'm going to take some of my Jigzillas, my Gambler Jigzillas. Um, these things are some awesome flipping jigs. Going to put me a big old otter on that thing. Or, uh, not an otter. Um... Uh, what did I, I just got it here, um, hang on, yeah, I'm going to use some of their flipping tubes too, where did I put that, where did I put that, I got this thing is pretty cool, it looks like one of them big water bugs, let me, let me grab it, I got a whole big bag of them, and Gambler's having a big uh, sale on these, uh, on tungsten, so if you guys want some tungsten, I got, I'm bringing a whole bunch of tungsten in, uh, thirty percent off. These things are called Why Nots, and uh, they're pretty neat. It looks like, like I say, it looks like a big water bug, and uh, so I'm gonna put this on my Jigzilla, and I'm gonna go out and flip some mat, and see if I can uh, rustle me up some largemouth this weekend, and then uh, we'll go out and find some smallies as well too, because I always like to nail a bunch of them. Maybe get some walleye. Put in Mississippi some evening, get some walleye. Anyhow, um. I think that's it for this week. 33 minutes, I should be. Anyways, uh, I'd like to thank Reno for uh, allowing me to do my podcast on his radio network again. Listening to Lanark County Confidential on the Reno Vial Outdoors web radio network, WRVO radio network. Go to Reno Vial Outdoors, click on the link, listen to it online, or I guess there's an app for Shoutcast or TuneIn, depending on whether you got an Android or an iPod, or an, I an iPod, I guess. No, an iPod. Um, iPhone. That's what it is. I'm not up on this technology stuff too much, so you can tell by my intro I'm trying to still figure it out. But anyways, um, thanks a lot this week. Um, I think I'm going to do it in the morning from now on. It's a lot easier, maybe. But anyways, uh, don't have as many interruptions. 
Gambler's got some uh, new stuff coming out. Got to go check it out. Um, fit, get it online or uh, find your local local uh, tackle store that's selling Gambler. If you can't find them, give me a call. Give me a send me an email. I'll send you some stuff in the mail if you want. Um, I got everything. Pretty much everything. <laughs> I got everything. I, anything Gambler has made, I pretty much have it. So, uh, and they make a lot of stuff. Um, so, anyways, thanks a lot. Enjoy, enjoy having you here with me, and um, I'm out of here. See you next week.